1996, when Freebird the movie first came out, Leonard Skinner guitarist Gary Rossington was asked his thoughts and feelings on it. You could tell by his hand movements and his looking around that he was a bit emotional. And being Gary, he tried to answer the interviewer, but was having a hard time speaking what was on his mind. After stuttering a little and being at loss for words, he simply said, It's kind of, uh, I can't find the words to express the way I feel about it. it uh, if I could play it, I could do it, but I, you know. Yes, this is true. Gary could express himself through his guitar. Gary Rossington is the only founding member of Leonard Skinner left standing now. We're going to go over a few things in Gary's life here. We'll talk a little about the writing and the recording of Freebird and the tuning he used to play slide guitar. We'll also talk some about his 59 Les Paul he named Bernice. So let's get right into it and start off from the beginning. He was born Gary Robert Rossington on December 5, 1951 in Jacksonville, Florida. His father passed away when Gary was very young and he was raised up by his mother, who he became very close to. His main interests growing up were baseball and music. In 1964, his friend Bob Burns, who was later to become the drummer for Leonard Skinner, got a set of drums. Gary was interested in the drums himself, but after a time he realized that they couldn't have a band with both of them drumming, so Gary started leaning toward the guitar. Gary started to pick up odd jobs and even pick up soda bottles to cash them in to save up some money, and finally he had enough to get him a silver tone guitar and a small amp. Once he had the guitar, him, Bob Burns, and another friend, Larry Jonstrom, who played bass, started a band. Gary said all they needed to do now was learn how to play. Gary learned a lot of guitar from his older sister's boyfriend who played in the band. He would often take the time to show Gary some guitar licks and chords. A couple of other boys from around town who they played baseball with got together for a jam once. They were Alan Collins and Ronnie Van Zandt. Gary says they played bits and pieces of songs that they all knew, and though none of them could even imagine, a new page in rock and roll history was just opened. They did finally graduate up to where Gary and Alan didn't have to play through the same amplifier with Ronnie singing out of the other side of that same amp. But they kept at it, and in time, the band would really come together. The equipment would upgrade for all of them. And I guess now is as good a time as any to talk about Gary's 59 Les Paul. He named it Bernice after his mother. Gary bought the guitar in 1971 from a gal whose husband had left her and left his guitar behind. This guitar has been used for writing and recording some of the most iconic songs in history. One night while recording some of the tracks for the Street Survivor album at Criteria Studios in Miami, Florida in April of 1977, Gary said he got lazy and left Bernice on the stand for the night. When he came back the next day, he said he strapped the guitar on and the whole headstock fell off. He guessed that someone cleaning the studio the night after they left had knocked it over and cracked it and just set it back in the stand. Gary said he started to cry like a baby. This guitar had a special sound and some tone that can't be replaced no matter how much money you have. And Gary was looking at his baby with the headstock hanging off. Gary just put the guitar down, left the studio, and started walking. The day's sessions were canceled. About a mile down the road, a couple of guys picked Gary up and took him back to the studio. The maintenance man there said, I got some glue that can fix that guitar. Well, Gary, being upset, of course, said, Glue? This is a precision instrument, and it's ruined. You can have it. So the maintenance man took it. But he took it home, and he glued it, and later brought it back to Gary and gave it to him. Gary says the guitar was perfectly fixed. Gary played the guitar for many years after this. I have no clue of any other repairs that has been done on it. Last I had heard, Gary had loaned it to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for display, although he may have it back now. If anyone else out there can add to this story, please do in the comments section. 
Around 1973, things started to come together for the band. During a week-long gig in Atlanta, the band was discovered by Al Cooper. After signing a record deal with MCA subsidiary Sounds of the South, Gary and the band entered the studio with Cooper producing. So after the years of playing, many hours of songwriting at the old Hell House practice shack in the Florida heat, the results were the Leonard Skinner pronounced album. Songs like Give Me Three Steps, Simple Man, Tuesday's Gone, and of course Freebird were on that album. During the recording, producer Al Cooper didn't think much of the song Gary and Ronnie Van Zandt had written called Simple Man and said it wasn't very good and didn't want to waste time on it. Not much is said about Gary's feelings at the time, but Ronnie Van Zant took the producer outside and told him if he didn't like the song, he could just stay out there until they recorded it. Ronnie walked back in the studio and the band laid down the Skinner classic while the producer sat outside thinking they were wasting time. The album was basically recorded with no overdubs, Gary says. It was recorded in less than a month. They just kept all the instruments isolated and recorded these songs just like they played them live. Ronnie would sing a scratch vocal while they played. Gary and Alan Collins did the guitar work. As bass player Leon Wilkinson had quit the group and Ed King was called and he played bass and after the album was recorded Leon returned and Ed would stay with the group and become the third guitarist. What Gary has to say about the writing and recording of Freebird is this. Around 1970, when we wrote the song, I had just started playing slide. Alan Collins had these chords, but Ronnie couldn't figure out any melody or lyric to go with them. We kept playing the chords over and over until Ronnie figured out some lyrics, and I came up with the slide part. But when I played, the bottle kept clinking against the frets because the strings were too low. I took a screwdriver of all things and stuck it under the strings up at the nut so it would raise the strings up like a steel guitar. Then I tuned the B string down to a G so the G and B string were both tuned to G. With the two G's it created a drawling double sound. He says he still sticks something under the strings to this day when he plays the song live not because he has to but just because he wants to. I read where Gary said in the studio that he played rhythm chords on his Les Paul while Alan played the slide on his Explorer in the opening and middle of the song. He says he played the slide fills during the song on his SG, so I'm assuming he overdubbed them later. Alan Collins played all the end solo on his Explorer. Anytime I saw the band live, Gary played all slide parts and he says he wrote them. But Gary says Alan played some of them in the studio. So if anyone has some more info or insight to add to this, please do so in the comments section. The band would go on to record four more studio albums and one live album. And then, on October 20th, 1977, the plane crash happened. I think Gary was one of the worst injured that lived through it. He had both legs, arms, wrists, and feet broken, as well as a broken pelvis and ribs, but he survived. Sadly though, the band with the loss of Ronnie Van Zant would never be the same. It took Gary a few years to recover. Once he did, him and Alan Collins tried to put the band back together. They got bass player Leon Wilkinson and piano player Billy Powell on board and decided to use the female backup singer from 38 Special, Dale Krantz. They built it as the Rossington Collins Band and it debuted in 1980 with the Anytime, Anyplace, Anywhere album, which went on to sell a million copies. And they went out on tour, but the second album didn't do so well and there were problems in the band. Alan Collins' wife died during a miscarriage. Gary broke his foot and they canceled six months of tour dates. And then Gary and singer Dale Kranz fell in love, got married, and retired to a log house in the Grand Teton Mountains to relax and raise a family. With the 10th anniversary of the crash coming up, Gary got some of the band members back together and they played the Charlie Daniels Volunteer Jam in 1987. It was well received and set the band off on a three-year run. 
and after some deep thinking, they decided to release a new album with new songs. The album went over great with the fans, as the songs were pretty well written, telling the story, with the old rock and roll guitar sound to back them. Keeping the Leonard Skinner songs alive is important to Gary. He says himself, they are a tribute band now just trying to keep the songs of Leonard Skinner out there for the fans to enjoy. Gary has had quite a few health issues with his heart and even some many strokes. His latest surgery was in 2021. He says he expects full recovery, but also said he has eaten nitroglycerin pills like Tic Tacs. He still plays when he's able with the tribute band. I'm sure as he ages, he feels the effect from the injuries of the plane crash more also. With the death of the original bass player Larry Junstrom in 2019, Gary is the last of the founding members of what was to become Leonard Skinner and left. He doesn't seem to get the recognition he should as the guitarist, especially since he wrote such great music and catchy guitar lines. Leonard Skinner was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2006. Gary said it was such a shame that the deceased members couldn't be there to experience it especially his closest bandmates, Ronnie Van Zant and Alan Collins, who as kids together used to dream of making it in music in a rock and roll band. Gary doesn't really speak a lot, as I pointed out in the beginning. For Gary, it was much easier for him to speak with his guitar. Listen close to some of the early Skinner albums and you'll see what I mean. Hope you enjoyed this video on Gary Rossington. If you did, I'd appreciate if you'd give it a like and then subscribe to the channel and ring that notification bell. I know there's still a lot left unsaid, so feel free to use the comments section and add to this story. I'd like to hear what y'all have to say. Thank y'all for watching.